on today's episode. The chairman and CEO of the XPRIZE Foundation, Dr. Peter Diamandis. The world's biggest problems are the world's biggest business opportunities. Want to become a billionaire, help a billion people. And the realization is that the day before something is really a breakthrough, it's a crazy idea. All the resources, all the capital, all the expertise is there. It's only going to be tapped if that target is in your heart and your soul. It's time to go Inside Quest with host Tom Billion, president and co-founder of the second fastest growing private company in America. And now, he's uncovering the universal principles of success. When you look at what holds people back, it's universally fear. Inside Quest starts right now. Everybody and welcome to Inside Quest. We are Moore's Law for the Mind. Our goal is to bring on amazing people who can put you on the path to exponential knowledge growth and push your intellect in bold and new directions. And if you're looking to mine the abundant resources of the brain, there is no better guest than the man joining us today. He's won countless awards and was named as one of the 50 greatest leaders by Fortune magazine. His accomplishments are so numerous and grand in scale, I want to punch myself in the face for being small-minded. A self-proclaimed nine-year-old at heart and a man who has a healthy disregard for the impossible, he is proof that no matter how audacious your goals are, with enough drive and tenacity, you can make them come true. Now, a lot of people say that, but this man's resume puts his statements way above the line of super credibility. He holds degrees in molecular genetics and aerospace engineering from MIT and a medical doctorate from Harvard University. He's the two-time best-selling co-author of Abundance, The Future is Brighter Than You Think, and Bold, How to Go Big, Create Wealth, and Impact the World. Some seriously great titles, but even better books. He's founded 17 companies in total, but just to name a few, he's co-founder and executive chairman of Singularity University, the chairman and CEO of the XPRIZE Foundation, co-founder and vice chairman of Human Longevity, Inc., a company with a goal that is near and dear to my heart, extending the high-performance human lifespan by 30-plus years. And he's also the co-founder and co-chairman of Planetary Resources, a company with the dizzyingly grand goal of mining near-Earth asteroids for precious resources to help human civilization open up the frontier to space. Please help me in welcoming a man who uses the 24 hours in his day more efficiently than any other human being, and someone who inspires me to be bold and think bigger every day the undisputed heavyweight champion of moonshot thinking, Dr. Peter Diamandis. Thank you, Tom. Such a pleasure. I'm gonna take that clip of my introduction and send to my mom. <laughs> That was great. She will be very happy, but I think a little horrified that you're not pursuing medicine, if I understand correctly. <laughs> oh my God, yeah. No, I grew up uh, in a household. Um, my dad was an OBGYN, a physician, and my mom could have been, and it was always expected I'd be, you know, becoming a doctor, taking over my dad's practice. And instead, I got sort of this, this bug about space, and it just uh, sort of drove me all my life. And um, so I went to medical school, made them happy, sent them a copy of the diploma. <laughs> And during my fourth year of medical school, I had two companies going, a space university and a launch company. Mm. And so as soon as I graduated, which was just barely by the skin of my teeth, I went off to go work on my space stuff. It's really fascinating. And you talk a lot about how you know, knowledge and learning has really changed over time. And the thing you need to do is follow your curiosity. And that was one of the reasons that I wanted to do this show was I wanted another quote that you have, which I think is utterly fantastic. Learning should be a means to an end, right? So learning sort of in a vacuum yeah. isn't necessarily very useful. Uh, so there should be a purpose to it. And the show really allowed me a chance to be super indulgent, to really research deeply people like yourself that I'm utterly fascinated by um, and, and really go deep inside their world. And the deeper inside your world I went, I really felt like I was getting the same impact that I got from reading Bold and Abundance, um, which are, so I have a list of Quake books. Those books that hit me so hard, they shook me. Uh, and, and for sure, those books are on that list. Bold, e even more so for me, was just right time, right place, the right message of what you. I needed to hear. And I have a copy of Peter's Laws on my desk, uh, which we'll get into in a second. But if you were going to sum up the way that you think, and you've said that the way you think is important. It's, it is the most important thing. How do you think? Uh, so I fundamentally believe that there is no problem we can't solve. It's just a matter of being 
uh, smarter, bringing the right people together, the right technology, the right capital, but every problem can be solved. And, and once you get over the uh, sort of the uh, initial dismay about a problem, or sort of like the shock of, oh my God, what am I going to do about this? If you can flip your mind and say, okay, there is an opportunity here, right? Uh, problems are gold mines. And what I tell CEOs or individuals, you know, if you can find some great problems and solve them, you're creating real value in the world for yourself, for your company, for your family, for everybody. And so I sort of like go heads down on a problem and focus on it till I crush it. That's a, a very interesting way to sum it up, that you go heads down on a problem till you crush it. Now, a lot of people uh, want to embody that, and very, very few people do embody that. And, and the impact that it seems like the Spirit of St. Louis had on you um, and seeing how a prize was leveraged to really create an industry um, was pretty fascinating. And then you start to do it yourself. And while I don't want to rehash a very well-told story of yours about how you, you know, go um, and launch the XPRIZE even before you've raised the money, but what I do want to talk about is you yourself confessed that it was so difficult raising the $10 million, you actually considered quitting, yeah. but why didn't you? So, uh, to tell the story a little bit, uh, you know, I, I read this book by Charles Lindbergh, The Spirit of St. Louis, and my passion in my childhood was uh, going into space, and I gave up on NASA being the way I was going to go there. And I said, okay, if I, you know, I want there to be the private spaceships. They don't exist. Can I create a, a prize uh, that would incentivize teams around the world to build private spaceships to take right. you and me into space? And so came up with this idea. It was going to be $10 million because there was enough money to inspire, you know, the rocket scientists, but not the Boeings and the Lockheeds. Uh, and you had to build a private spaceship, take three adults up 100 kilometers, land safely, and within two weeks do it again. And I said, okay, this is, I think someone could win this thing. And I actually went to St. Louis where Lindbergh had won, had, had raised the money for his airplane, because he was going after a $25,000 prize, the first person to fly New York to Paris. And I raised about a half a million dollars from some great uh, visionary St. Louisans, but I got stuck, not with, I couldn't find the $10 million. I said, hell with it, we'll announce it anyway. And um, <laughs> it, was, it was a ballsy move, uh, one I'm thankful for. We, uh, I learned in thinking about this that how you announce something in the world really matters. If you announce something below a line of credibility, people dismiss it out of hand and say, that's stupid, what, is, you know, what does he think he can do? And then if you announce it above the line of credibility, people will watch and see what you can do and whether it succeeds or fails. And in, in our minds, we don't realize we have this line of super credibility. Mm. If you announce an idea, a project, your vision above a line of super credibility, people go, oh my God, how can I be involved? What can I do to be part of this? And um, so when we announced this prize, I actually used the money we raised to create a super credible setting uh, we had on the stage under the arch in St. Louis, not one astronaut, but 20 astronauts with me. I had the head of NASA, the head of the FAA, the Lindbergh family, and we announced this $10 million prize. And, and none of the media said, hey, do you have the money? Do you have any teams? Because we didn't. <laughs> 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 and it was, you know, the headlines was, you know, $10 million prize announced. And, and I was not lying about it. If anyone asked me, I would say, no, we're going to go out and raise the money. Right. But it, was, it really uh, came across. And so I set out to try and go raise the money. And it, I was sure it was going to be relatively easy because you only paid the $10 million after right. someone pulled off the space flight. But everyone said, why isn't NASA doing this? Can anyone really pull it off? And the clincher was, isn't someone going to die trying? Mm. And I realized in that moment how risk adverse we'd gotten as a society. You know, we are so, uh, so fearful of taking risks. And... And the realization is that the day before something is really a breakthrough, it's a crazy idea. And unless you're doing risky things and trying crazy ideas, you're stuck in incremental improvement. And so it took uh, the better part of uh, you know, 1996 through five, six years to raise the $10 million. Mm -hmm. And I had so many people saying, oh my God, give it up, it's not gonna happen. To answer your question, I didn't give it up because it was my highest purpose in life. It was why I was on this planet. And if, if, you're, if you're zoned in on your highest purpose in life, then every moment you're spending doing that is a moment that's, that you should be. Let's talk about that. Yeah. So you've got uh, a phrase, I don't know if you coined it or if you just shoved it into my mind, but the massively transformative purpose. Yeah. 
which is something that uh, I learned the very hard way and wish that I had had your book before that. Built a company just to get rich. That was really the, the end goal. This is our last company. Yeah. Um, and, and while we may have touched the sort of bottom level of rich, it was soul destroying and, and just yeah. found myself emotionally totally. bankrupt. Yeah. Um, what is it, do you think, about that's, that massively transformative purpose that gives people the ability to fight when it gets hard that they don't have when it's not there? Yeah, so I've done the same thing out of my 17 companies. A couple were like, this is a get rich quick scheme, right? And those were like the worst performers. Right. Because ultimately, you know, the companies that really were amazing for me, I, I sort of call them overnight successes after 10 years of hard work. <laughs> uh, it's because it's like at three o'clock in the morning, I wasn't doing it for someone else. Yeah. I wasn't doing it for my mom, for my dad, for some investor. I was doing it because it was for me, all right? And that you tap a source of energy and your passion and your heart that is infinite. And I think that's really it. And it, it allows you to go harder. And also, you know, as a CEO, you know that when you're presenting to your uh, to investors or to customers or to partners, they are, they're getting involved as a transference of trust to you, right? They're entrusting their products, their services, their people, whoever it is to you. And I, you know, I'm not sure what it fully is, but I can, you can tell when someone's bullshitting you, when mm -hmm. someone's real. And if it's your MTP, your massively transformative purpose, and it's true to your heart, it comes over so strong, so hard that it's intoxicating. People want to be with you. They want to support you. It's like, I believe in this person. Right. How do you, so you have two young children, yeah. twins, yes? Yeah, fraternal twins, boys. Yeah. Okay. And what are you going to do to help them find, because this is the number one question I get, which is normally phrased in the form of passion, right? I talk a yeah. lot about this company. It's my passion. That's yeah. why I'm able to fight harder, all the things that you just said. Uh, and then the next question people ask is, how do you find that? How are yeah. you going to help your kids find their MTP? The most important thing is, is helping them find their passion and remain mm -hmm. curious. That is like the most important thing, because in a world where AI and robots and, you know, all of this tech can, can do almost anything for us eventually. It's gonna be sort of technological socialism where technology mm -hmm. helps us do whatever we wanna do. The question is, what do you wanna do? Right. And so uh, I think early on it's exposing them to as much as possible and just listening to what they love. Uh, I know that my parents wanted me to become a doctor, right? Sure. And so I was like going here towards space and they wanted me to be a doctor and, and I had this sort of like split personality there. Uh, my goal is for them, for me not to drive them in any way I want them to go because you can create a profession doing anything, right? One of my dear friends, an investor, a partner, his dad was a Skylab and shuttle astronaut and he grew up in Houston where all his friends were kids of astronauts and he barely, I don't, think he, I don't know if he graduated high school and he never went to college and he just played video games as a kid. And you can imagine where your dad's a PhD, you know, this amazing uh, uh, sort of hero. But he became so enamored with video games, he started writing video games, and he ended up making hundreds of millions of dollars writing video games, and then bought a flight through one of my company's space adventures to go to the space station, and became the first second generation astronaut in a completely different path. That's cool. Right? So I think passion and curiosity is the most important thing. And for people who are sort of older in age, and they say, well, how do I find my passion? Uh, I have two ideas that I use for mind experiments. The first is, what did you want to do as a kid? Mm. Right? And if you can go back to your childhood fantasies of whatever you wanted to do, uh, consider doing that because it really ties down to, now I do consider myself a nine-year-old kid. I love what I do. I wake up every day with this extraordinary adventure I'm on. And then... The other side is if I gave you a billion dollars, what would you do with it? Right. You know, if you did, couldn't spend it on yourself, but you wanted to go and do something really impactful and passionate and meaningful in the world, what would you do with that money besides throw a massive party? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so these are two sort of like ways to grapple with that idea of your inner passion. It's really been fascinating to watch how people can encounter the same idea, right? You've said this before, it's something that I've talked a lot about, finding your passion, and then how few people are actually able to articulate in their own mind that thing that they are passionate about. Um, 
tying that back to what you said earlier about curiosity, which to me is the absolute starting point of that, right? A curiosity turns into a passion. Yep. Um, do you think curiosity is innate or do you think that there's a how to getting someone on a so path to curiosity? It's great. Uh, so first of all, I think that uh, curiosity is a evolutionary uh, critical phenotype. In other words, I call it, I used to talk about the exploration gene. Mm. And part of it is a curiosity gene because as, as early hominids, as early prehistoric ancestors of humans in the, in the plains of Africa, you know, it would be pretty easy to sort of stay where you are and never wonder what's over the next horizon. But if you did that, you could get wiped out by a local disaster. Right. But those who sort of developed, uh, and I'm, you know, we can talk about human longevity, my, my latest company, which is the largest genome sequencing facility in the world, and we find out a lot of how we think and who we are is genetic. Uh, uh, though, you know, you can add to it, and I think people can learn to be more and more curious. Um, but I think curiosity drove us to look over the next horizons and disperse ourselves over the entire planet which increased our survivability. Because as one place got wiped out by some disease, mm -hmm. the, uh, the human race continued along the planet. So I think it is innate. I think we as humans uh, have been driven by it. It is, curiosity has driven us to be healthier, uh, more, uh, more vibrant, more abundant in our life in almost every way because we explore and we create and we solve because of curiosity. You talk about how um, people seek, just we have it at, at a genomic level, we have this desire to go out, possibly because it avoids a local uh, disease or yeah. famine, whatever, yeah. from wiping everyone out. So, ah, it makes sense, the people that sort of wandered off. But you take it farther into an area that I find utterly fascinating um, in explaining your own obsession with space and that it is the ultimate frontier, and that there are no frontiers left. This is one, maybe like an obscure thing, but as I was reading it, dude, it stopped me dead in my tracks, I had the chills. Because you're like, this is the, uh, we're in this unique time in history where you, you can no longer fuck up and start over. Yeah. Like that doesn't exist. I've got yeah. your thumbprints, you're all over the internet. And, and that denies this intrinsic human oh my desire. Oh so sure, so absolutely correct. And Thank you, first of all, you honor me by having actually dug that deep, and I'm, I'm grateful for it. It's so true, right? Because if you, I say, if you fucked up in the old days, you would like get on a ship and cross the Atlantic Ocean, right. and you'd have a chance like start all over again, <laughs> or you'd hop on a, a horse and start going west. You just don't anymore. Mm -hmm. And so there's a situation that, oh my God, I have to succeed on my first shot, or there is no other shot. So you start becoming really, really careful. Right. And if you become really, really careful, you don't take risks. You don't take risks. You can't take any moonshots. You can't innovate, and you're screwed. You're stuck in this like minor loop. You could be lucky, but um, and one of the things that makes America still so great compared to other parts of the world, and I travel nonstop around the planet, and what makes California Silicon Valley so incredible is the fact that we call, you know, screwing up here experience. Right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and the other parts of the world, you know, you're screwed up. You got a black, your black mark that follows you to your grave, right. and that really sucks. And so when everybody says, "Oh, how can we create sort of the Silicon Valley of filling your blank country?" It's like, okay, change your bankruptcy laws, change people who think about screwing up, you know, change all these things. It's really tough, but um, I think that we have a moral obligation as a species to go beyond the Earth. We have the ability. Uh, and, I mean, honestly, we live during the most extraordinary time ever in human history. Like, the next 20 years is like, everything is happening, right? Mm -hmm. Extending the healthy human lifespan, you know, going out to the stars, colonizing planets, mining asteroids. I mean, it's like, there is no, I mean, we're living in fantasy world, right. which <laughs> sort of like makes me believe we're living in a VR experience in the first place, but that's a yeah. different conversation. <laughs> One um, I'm eager to have. Oh, though. I'm happy to, I, I have it all the time. So, uh, it is... So we have the ability to, uh, to take the human race beyond the bounds of Earth. Uh, to, as my friend Elon says, back up the biosphere. And I believe we have to. I believe that it is a moral obligation uh, and that we have the ability now. It's not easy, but it is, it is viable. We actually have the ability to duplicate human knowledge. It's called the internet. And we now have the ability to go and actually sequence all the life forms and store them and, you know, when you think about it, 
I think about Gaia, the living Earth, as a, as a living organism. Mm. And I think about the notion that we're about to bud, you know, as a portion of the human race goes and starts to move beyond, and it's life. It's repeating cycles of life over and over and over again. Yeah, there's something that you said, and that kind of speak, like, it, people must get caught up in your dream a lot because your dream is so well thought out, uh, and there's so much excitement in it. But what I love is that at the end of the day, it's, it's a game of no bullshit, what would it take, right? It's a game of, there. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying that people just don't see the solution. The solutions are often brutally difficult. Yeah. So when you said that, okay, how do we replicate Silicon Valley in these other places? The answer is change your bankruptcy laws. You know, like, you, there's this I mean, I have I have stuff. a formula that I will sit down with someone who's serious and say, this is what it takes, these things you have to do. And what the people watching today may not know is that you've done this with zero G. It is one of my favorite stories of yours of just not relenting. <laughs> so that, that's really a story worth telling if you don't mind. Sure, happily. So uh, the year is 1993 uh, and I'm trying desperately to get onto NASA's zero G airplane. Uh, they have an airplane they've been flying for the better part of uh, 40 years for training astronauts. And I'm a space cadet, nine-year-old space cadet. And of course, I want to go on this zero-g airplane. Like, can I volunteer? Can I be a medical subject? What can I do? No, 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 no. I said, screw you. I'll just do it myself. Right. That's my reaction when everyone says no. I said, okay, fine, I'll just do it myself. I go to the FAA and say, okay, we want to commercially get a large, we're going to use a Boeing 727, take the seats out of the most of the airplane, put 35 people in the back of the airplane, 36 to be exact, uh, buckle them in, and then take them out of their seatbelts after takeoff and then put the airplane up in a 50 degrees, you know, nose up, push it over the top. People will come float around inside the airplane. And they said, you want to do what? And I was like, I want to do what NASA has been doing for the last 40 years. And it was funny because at the end of the day, I said to the bureaucrats, uh, I'm not giving up. You're going to retire before I give up. I love that. And, I love that. and it's the truth. I, 11 years later, 11 years later, and I worked my way up to the, to the FA administrator, uh, Marion Blakey, an amazing woman with more cojones than the rest of them put together. And, uh, and she blessed it, and we began operating, and we've been operating for the better part of uh, 11 years, flown tens of thousands of people in the zero G uh, wow. safely. Uh, my favorite story is I got a chance to meet Stephen Hawking. And Stephen Hawking, uh, we were going to sequence his genome this is back in 2006, seven, And on the first conversation, he said, I want to fly into space. And he's a uh, you know, space enthusiast. I can't do that right now, but I can fly into zero G. Mm. And through his digital device, he said, yes. And so I put out a press release that we we're going to take the world's expert in zero in gravity right. and give them the experience of zero gravity. And of course, you know, he's been wheelchair bound for the better part of 20 years. He's got serious medical conditions and so forth. And I got two phone calls the very next day after putting out the press release, both saying, you're insane. <laughs> <laughs> you know, take this guy, the world's you know, most famous physicist and kill him. <laughs> and I'm like, no, 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 you don't understand. The reason I started Zero G was to give everyone who wanted the chance to experience weightlessness the chance to do it instead of having to go through the government bureaucracy. And so I had my aircraft partner tell me, you're crazy. The other one was a, uh, a government agency, I won't mention who they are, um, who called me, but their initials are FAA. <laughs> 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 and, and so, uh, long story short, it took the better part of about four months because the FAA said, your operating license prohibits you from flying anybody who's not an able-bodied flyer, right. quote unquote. And I said, well, what determines if he's an able-bodied flyer? And they sort of paused and they said, well, I guess it would be his physician or a um, medical expert in this area. I said, okay. I went, contacted his physicians, got two uh, aerospace docs. I bought malpractice insurance for all of them, got them to write letters to the FAA That's that amazing. he was an able-bodied flyer. And uh, long story, he had an amazing flight. And the next flight we did was for a bunch of kids who had never walked who were in wheelchairs that he cleared the path for. 
That, that's tenacity uh, in in life. I mean, that that's su such a profound example of what it means to not give up, to have your eyes set on something and really go after it. And that, to me, is the difference because our show's really aimed at people that want to do something with their life. They want to escape the drudgery of a nine to five job. They mm -hmm. have the passion inside, but they don't know how to execute on it. And I think the biggest gap that they have is that that they hit an obstacle and they stop. And it's the concept that obstacles make people feel really good. They're really comforting because they mean that you don't have to work anymore, <laughs> right? And Boundary conditions. Exactly. But once you remove that, which you have done so profoundly and I think have placed yourself at a nexus of people and ideas that is so profound, largely because everyone wants to warm their hands on that flame of you get shit done, <laughs> That's utterly incredible, and, and I'm going to go into your laws here in a second, but uh, I just want to put a pin in it for anybody watching here um, online on Periscope. Guys, like, this is it. Th this moment, what he's talking about now, the ability to say, this is what I want. I identify the things that are stopping me, and one by one, I'm going to chip away at them. I don't know if you heard him, but I did. I will outlast you. <laughs> You'll retire before I'll quit. Like, that gives me the chills. Like, the notion of looking your enemy in the face and telling them that on a long enough timeline, I always win. So, fold up. Make it easy. You can run, but you'll just die tired. That really, really Thank you. is so powerful. All right. And, and, and if I could, just because it really is, and that my last book, Bold, was all about that, right? Which is, as an individual, the constraints are off. You know, what were the constraints? The constraints used to be, I don't have money easiest constraint to use, right? But we're living in a world today of $15 billion per year in crowdfunding. Mm. Uh, money should not be a constraint. There's plenty of capital out there. There's plenty of, if you're doing something that really is meaningful, other people want to do as well, uh, you can find the capital. It used to be expertise was a, you know, I, can't, I don't know how to code, or I don't know how to market, or I don't know how to do whatever. There are plenty of people out there, and you can live in a world of crowdsourcing where you can find the tech or the people, you know, so, and the same thing on technology, you know, a child today <laughs> able to go online can get access to more server capacity than the head of the Defense Department could 20 years ago. You know, I mean, it's an insane amount of stuff that we have access to. So if you really stop and you make the list of what is stopping you, you can knock them down. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, the thing that stops you is your mindset. Um, either you don't want to take the risk, uh, you don't believe you truly can, and then the option there is to take it incrementally. Take a first step that you can prove to yourself you can do it. Because I didn't get where I am here by shooting for mining asteroids or extending the human lifespan. You know, I did the first thing. It's like, oh, wow, I did that. That's so cool. And ultimately, you need confidence in yourself. Right. And then you create a community of people of confidence in you. And together, you take the next step. And you find some partners. You take the next step. And pretty soon... You know, 10 doublings later, you're a thousand times further along. 20 doublings later, you're a million times. 30 doublings, you're a billion times further along. And that's the world we're living in today. Yeah, the, the notion of what you can do with exponential growth is, is really amazing. And it's even more amazing coming from the guy who understands that you still have to do the doubling of 0.001 to 0.002. And you actually have a great quote about um, that connectedness that you were talking about a second ago that I want to read. This is you. Um, Historically, if you wanted to touch the lives of a billion people, you had to be Coca-Cola, GE, or Siemens. Today, you can be a guy or a gal in a garage with connectivity. Yeah. You know, talking about being tearing down the, the limitations, most of them have been torn down for you. Yeah. So now it's about your mindset. Do you have the ability to look at the world's greatest challenges and say, there's simple steps. There may be a lot, but there are simple steps between me and that goal. And now it's about identifying identifying what those mm -hmm. steps are and then executing. Your company, Planetary Resources, there was an awesome article. I wish everyone, unfortunately, <laughs> so I'm in a spoiler alert, I'm gonna ruin it for everybody. <laughs> but he was being interviewed by a guy who hadn't quite done his research and he was like, oh, so you've got this company, Planetary Resources, you guys are gonna be mining asteroids, so in 10 or 20 years, you'll be able to make some money. But, you know, basically, what are you gonna do between now and then? And your response was, dude, we're cash flow positive now. <laughs> I had to laugh out loud on that because what he couldn't see was that you could make business models all along the way. Yeah. Like, I may have this grand goal of ultimately capturing the asteroid and all that, but I'm going to take these very incremental steps and I'm going to force them to be useful today. Yeah, absolutely. And that's it's really important. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll use a, uh, an example again of, uh, of Elon Musk in this regard. His mission is taking humans to Mars. Mm. And, you know, that's not necessarily a cash flow positive business today. <laughs> uh, it will be one day, 
but he built a launch vehicle capacity that is uh, ultimately crushing Lockheed and Boeing and, Air and Ariane and has built a $15 billion value company along the way. Mm. And so I think ultimately for us, expanding the human ecosystem of resources is our MTP. It's our massively transformative purpose. It's, it's, it's creating abundance for everybody where you're not limited by the resources of a planet, right? I mean, these people who say, oh, we have to conserve and conserve and conserve and we have to take the pie and slice it up thinner as more people on the planet. Dude, make more pies. Right. And, and that's really the vision here of we're living in a, on a, in a world, in a solar system. Uh, you know, I think of our earth as a crumb in a supermarket filled with resources. It's a and, great analogy. And that's what we're going for. It's a great analogy. Um, the crumb in a supermarket of resources hints it at the way you think, which obviously is how I wanted to start the show. And that's the thing in reading uh, Abundance, I felt like I got a framework for how I should view the world. And then in Bold, I felt like I had the framework for how I should be thinking. Mm. Um, and the quote we talked about earlier, you know, the most important resource that you have is your own mindset. It's very, very powerful and something that we talk a lot about here and certainly something that I cultivate in myself. Um, and in, in going through your laws, it, it was, I was laughing at times, I got the chills, other times <laughs> I was literally left with awe. And I just wanna go through a couple of them sure, because I think sure. that they are, they're so critical um, for people and the way that they hint at how, it's the how that's interesting to me, right? You're very good at explaining the why, the need for passion, curiosity, a massively transformative purpose, but that isn't the how. You're also incredibly diligent about the how, and I think that's why you've transcended where a lot of people stop, because it's, it's, it's like taking a drug to be inspired, but it's like being set free to be inspired to action. Mm. And when you get inspired to action, things change. And that seems to be the thesis to me of, of your whole philosophy. So the, the laws, just a few, there are many, like 28 laws or something. Yeah. Uh, absolutely brilliant, each one is amazing, but I'm gonna read just a few uh, choice ones and we'll go back, there's sure. a few I want you to touch on. Uh, when given a choice, take both. If you can't win, change the rules. If you can't change the rules, then ignore them. When forced to compromise, ask for more. When faced without a challenge, make one. The squeaky wheel gets replaced. The faster you move, the slower time passes, the longer you live, I love that one. <laughs> The world's most precious resource is the persistent and passionate human mind. Those are, are startling. And I know that some of them, one that I didn't read, um, if it can go wrong, fix it to hell with Murphy, yeah. was a reaction to the way you see other people limit That was the thinking. first one. Yeah, I had a, a, a dear friend of mine who was co-founder of my first university, uh, International Space University, put up as a joke Murphy's Law uh, on, on the wall. And I had this, you know, if things go wrong, it will staring at me day in and day out. I just right. got pissed at it. <laughs> and so I went on the whiteboard behind me and I said, if anything can go wrong, fix it to hell with Murphy. And I wrote Peter's Law. And, um, and I believe that, right? Because ultimately, of course shit's gonna go wrong. If you try and do right. anything in the world, stuff is gonna go wrong. Sure. We live in a world of increasing entropy. Um, and, and then I started sort of cataloging my thoughts underneath that. And it was, you know, when given a choice, take both came next and, and so forth. And ultimately, um, in a time of crisis, like when the shit hits the fan, how you react uh, matters. And again, it's how you think. And so my laws are intended to be sort of go-to, how do you react in this situation? Uh, and believe me, we are all have an animal mind in us that we react with fear, we react with anxiety, we react with whatever, and that's the, it's going to be the first reaction, you're human. Mm. Uh, but the next reaction, okay, this is what's just happened. Uh, how, do I, how do I handle this? Where do I go? And my, my laws are sort of my set of laws and I, well, I, I write in bold, you're welcome to steal these, duplicate them, modify them, whatever, create your own laws right. that are your go-to set of uh, your mindset when you see great opportunity or great failure, when the world is changing uh, how you react is important. Why do you do that? One of the things that I find utterly fascinating about you is you're hell-bent to convince people that the future is brighter than they think. 
it only helps them to realize that. You could take that as a secret and run with it and, <laughs> and just make amazing things happen and people could cry doom and gloom and you'd still be able to benefit from all the amazing things that you know are coming. So why, why do you work so hard? Oh, wow. Um, I don't know. I just, that's the way I'm wired. Uh, I think I, I see the world a certain way and I get pissed at the news media for what they do. You know, I'm on a... Paint the dark, gloomy picture. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I joke, but I'm serious. I say the crisis news network or the constantly <laughs> negative news network or whatever you call CNN is just in the, in the business of, of, of painting this terrible view of the world. They're, I mean, people have to realize that the news media is, in, is, a, is a business. Their job is delivering your eyeballs to their advertisers, not doing this as a public service. Right. And it turns out that we pay 10 times more attention to negative news than positive news. And so I actually have stopped watching the news. Uh, I've been on a, a media diet for years now because I get all the news I need from Google News uh, filters, whatever the case might be. Mm. But rather than having uh, the news media pummel it in my head over and over and over again, HD in high definition of every murder on the planet, you know, I know shit's happening, but the fact of the matter is they don't report the majority of the news or the amazing things going on in the world because it doesn't benefit them. And so I want people to realize that the world is getting better at an extraordinary rate. You know, the human lifespan is more than doubled. It's going to double again. The per capita income for every nation is more than tripled. The cost of food has dropped 13-fold. Energy has dropped 20-fold. We're going about to go to a, a solar economy that's going to just decimate a lot of um, old world oil economies, but it's gonna uplift the planet. And with abundant energy comes abundant clean water and health and education. All of these things are heading towards an extraordinary world. Now, I'm not naive to say there isn't you know, bad shit happening. Sure. It's just that it is happening at a lower and lower rate per person. You know, your chance of dying a violent death were 500 times worse you know, a couple of centuries ago. Right. And we, we hear all this violence. I just saw, you know, the movie about, uh, you know, Compton and uh, in the theaters, amazing movie, right? Um, and, but ultimately, you know, we live globally in a fairly peaceful time in human history. Uh, you look at violent deaths, if you graph it, it's just like this massive decrease over time. It's just we now have one of these and every place there's a murder, mm. it's being captured and being right. transmitted to you. So talk to us about education in this new world. It, I find very, very interesting. Um, on the surface, it seems like there's a, a disconnect between some of your rhetoric on education and the fact that you founded two universities. Yeah. But when you actually look at the universities, you realize they're your answer. You might be using the, the known word of university, but you're approaching things in a very different yeah. way. Talk so, us through the, what you think are the failings of the current education system as it relates to expertise being so fleeting. Yeah. Those are your words yeah. um, and, and how you're addressing that. Sure. So you got to remember when universities were started, uh, you know, between 500 years ago to 200 years ago, most of the oldest universities were started over the last, even the last 100 years or 100 years and, and past. The average lifespan in the 1600s through the mid 1800s was like 28 years old mm. and if you lived to 50 that was a ripe old age and even a hundred years ago the average age was 50 or 60 with the uh, advent of better sanitation and the germ theory and so forth and so you would go to school and you would learn something by the you know by the early 20s and that would last you for the next 20 years because things didn't change and so you could learn something that would be current for the next 20 years. Right. But of course, that's all bullshit right now, right? By the time you graduate school, what you learn in your freshman year is, is probably out of date. And so for me, it's about reinventing education. Education needs to be a continuous process, right? Which is why you're all here, why you're right. watching the show. You're learning something constantly. And I think we need to, we're reinventing education at the upper levels. For me, it should be passion driven. You should be taking something you want to learn to apply it because you can learn anything. You can learn enough to be an interface to someone who's an expert at a minimum or go heads down on something, but driven by the passion of, I'm going to apply it for this MTP, for this purpose. I want to build this company. I want to solve this problem. 
And when you, when you approach education, not in theory, but in application, it takes on a completely different set. Um, and so my latest university, Singularity University, up in uh, Moffett Field in Mountain View, is a university where <coughs> graduate students and executives come back on a pretty regular basis. We have a, a lot of content for free on the web. But then you've got amazing online universities, from the Khan Academy to you know, uh, Udacity, where you can learn, you can say, I want to know about Bitcoin, I want to know about blockchain, I want to know about you know, breakthroughs in gene sequencing, and you can go and you know, learn it. So I think that's where we're heading, where education is driven by one's passion and you learn you know, just in time for when you want to know, you can go deeper and deeper and deeper. Um, and then ultimately on the other side of the spectrum, for children, uh, we live on a planet where there are about a billion illiterate people. Uh, two-thirds of those are women, uh, 250 million of them are kids, and they live in parts of the world where you'll never build enough schools or teach enough teachers to scale. Right. But, but these things do scale, right? And so we just launched a $15 million X Prize called the Global Learning X Prize, and it's for an Android app that can take a child in the middle of no place from illiteracy to basic reading, writing, and numeracy in 18 months. And so the goal is give a kid an Android phone or tablet with this app on it, and that app needs to be um, compelling enough where they don't want to put it down. And right. there's, as they're playing it, they're learning. Because once they've got some level of literacy, the world is open on the internet, right? All access to all information. And we know that the two most important things uh, for uplifting a country, reducing its population growth rate and making it a peaceful, more prosperous nation, is literacy and health. You give a country literacy and health, the number of children per family go from like six or seven to two or three, or in the case of parts of the US and Japan and parts of Europe, going to negative growth. Mm. You know, we may have another problem uh, 20 years from now of uh, a reducing growth rate on the planet. Right, which is not something people talk a lot about. No, we talk about, about overpopulation and all of that. Right, so in, in that story that you were just talking about with technology and the Global Learning X Prize, which by the way, if I can be of service in any way, truly, truly, I would it's give the beginning myself of a over friendship. that. Would be, yeah. I would love that. Yeah. The, one of the things you've highlighted in talking about a glimmer of knowing how well it works was the where they put the tablet facing into an impoverished oh, village. That's great. Yes. The kids that don't speak the language, they've never used the internet before. Um, we're, we have really little time, and then we have to get you out of here. Yeah, but no, if you can, yeah, sure. So, I mean, there was an experiment that was done. I write about this in Abundance, and where an uh, MIT professor took a tablet, and it's called the hole in the wall. And he put a hole in the wall into a, like a favela, a, mm -hmm. um, a, a very poor... Uh, slum and with no instructions just where kids were playing he put the tablet and the kids basically learned how to navigate it learned how to teach themselves uh, and learned how to utilize the tech uh, and even learned how to program and it's the realization that what we have between our skull is this massive pattern recognition machine and if you give it the capability, it will learn how to learn. Right. And it will create extraordinary capabilities. And I think it's really uh, uplifting humanity to give it the tools for self-learning. Uh, and that's, that's the amazing world we're heading towards, a world of abundance where no matter where you're on the planet, you have access to knowledge and information. Where, you know, the key thing that gets me so excited is we're living on a planet in 2010, we had 1.8 billion people connected online. Today, we're at about 2.8, 2.9 billion people connected in, what are we, 2015. Um, in the next five years, there are at least five private orbital and atmospheric constellations about to be launched by Facebook, by Google, by SpaceX, by, uh, by Virgin, and by Qualcomm, and, and by Samsung that will provide a megabit connection to every single human on the planet. So imagine, not, imagine a kid in the middle of nowhere coming online not like you and I did with AOL at 9600 baud, right? <laughs> but with a megabit, with access to the world's information, access right. to as much computational power as they want. It's like, it's the most massive dividend of innovation and knowledge and capacity about to come online. Right. We ain't seen nothing yet. Yeah. It's, it's extraordinary. Yeah, there's a great clip of you running through like, uh, what will they want? What will they invent? Yeah, what well, will they bring to the global conversation? Uh, just, I don't think people can really conceive of the scale 
of that many people. And one of the things, the, the tablet story he was talking about where they, they put it into the favela, uh, what they asked the kids to learn in a language that they didn't know was like molecular biology. I mean, yeah, it was yeah, so yeah. crazy. Yeah. I was like, eight and nine year olds speaking a language using technology they already know. And they like took how? an exam on it and, and did better than yes. other uh, it, was, it was so crazy. Students. I was like, what is happening? And it really showed me that there is the, the wealth of, or the depth of human capability yeah. is so massive. Yeah. And just tapping into that, giving these people the, the connectivity, the technology that they need, and you've got a great quote, money, people, and technology, anything is possible. Yeah. And yeah. that was such a, a glimpse into how profoundly true that really is. Yeah, it's really, we're living in a world where there is no problem we cannot solve. Uh, and it's just a matter of realizing it and focusing the right attention on it. The right, ultimately, people are the key. You know, there's plenty of money and plenty of technology. Without the right people, nothing happens. Right. And it's just um, extraordinary. I'll, I'll, I'll just mention, obviously, we're here at, uh, at Quest and, and the nutrition world. One of the things I'm so amazed about is uh, this latest company, Human Longevity. We have built now the world's largest genome sequencing facility. This is a company that's less than two years old. Uh, but besides sequencing, we're now sequencing more human genomes than the rest of the world combined, and then sequencing your full microbiome, and then uh, doing a full uh, MRI of the body, and doing a full, uh, what's called a, a metabolome, the 23 chemicals in your bloodstream. And we're starting to understand our programming, who we are, and we really believe we have the ability to extend the healthy human lifespan. You know, my goal is make 100, then you 60. Right, right. have that. the agility, have the, the mobility, the aesthetics, the cognition at 100 that you have at 60, and then that gives a horizon for even greater breakthroughs mm. coming down the line. And so, it's just a blast. <laughs> yes, it is. It's a blast just to watch you at a distance. Thank you, Pal. All right, before you go, if yeah. you don't mind, I think you, you've got such an ability to um, get people to understand thinking at scale and being bold and the notion of if you want to make a billion dollars, touch a billion lives. Um, if you had 30 seconds to get these guys thinking just down a new path, a more exciting path, a bigger path, what would you tell them? I mean, so ultimately, it's what is it that gets you up in the morning and is, gets you excited? What do you want to do as a kid? How would you really go and make an impact on the world? You know, as you said, for me, the world's biggest problems are the world's biggest business opportunities. You want to become a billionaire, help a billion people. Uh, there is nothing we cannot do. It's really a matter of setting a focus goal because without a target, you'll miss it every time. Picking a target and then picking the steps along the way and realizing that the, all the resources, all the capital, all the expertise is there. But ultimately, it's only going to be tapped if that target is in your heart and your soul. Peter, thank you so much for coming on. What an incredible time that was. Thank, thank you. you. Guys, thank you so much for joining us. If you're not already watching the podcast, you're going to want to go to iTunes right now, download this one, watch it again. It was well worth it. It is absolutely my honor to have had uh, this man on this stage today and share it with somebody who really has pushed me in my own life to think bigger, to dream bigger, and most importantly, to execute on those dreams. It is so critical that you guys take that lesson away. Research them as much as you can. Drop them into YouTube. You'll lose days just <laughs> watching the amazing stuff that is on this person. Read his bio. What he's done is absolutely inhuman. In fact, I'm gonna take that back. What he's done is incredibly human, and he shows just how far you can go with a passionate and persistent human mind. Be passionate and persistent, my friends. If you haven't already, subscribe here. Until next week, be legendary. Thank you for joining us. Peter, again, thank you so thank much, you. man. Truly a pleasure.